Okay. Well, so the idea is that we go over uh, chapter three, what do teachers bring to the teaching learning process so that you can go over these ideas, okay, and use them when you, uh, let's say, write your reports, especially for the analysis and the conclusions you have to draw. Okay, yes. So, do you have the book with you available or do you want me to share it on the screen? Because I can do that. I have it ready. <laughs> Sorry. Tell me what you prefer. Shall I share it on the screen? Okay. Yes, please. All right. This is in the uh, drive, all right, of Seminario de la Práctica Docente that you have the, the link in Moodle, right? So you have access to this. Apparently, there are two versions of the same book. I uh, I chose uh, the, the oldest one. Why? Because I, something was wrong with the first and it seemed very difficult for me to open it, right? I have my own book write my copies but just to let you know if that link is broken or there is some uh, let's say inconvenience when you try to open the pdf try with the other one the oldest the one that was published in august uh, 2021 okay well in here, we, what we're going to uh, learn is about, uh, let's say, we, um, aspects of our inner world and what we say, the teacher's inner world, that have to do uh, with um, the insights that may be conscious or unconscious, right? On what? On what we believe about teaching what we believe about learning, what we believe about language, and what we believe about learners, okay? I would say that the first two concepts that we should bear in mind is, uh, let's say, that of um, deep-rooted beliefs, Okay, deep-rooted beliefs or school biographies. And what is that? That is everything that happens to you as you are a student uh, from kindergarten on. Remember uh, Eric Erickson's epigenetic principle that says that learning is lifelong, right? So in a way, everything we do as learners will define much of what we do as teachers. But uh, I would say that this is independent from what? From uh, the language classroom. It has to do with any type of learning that we do. Okay? So our routines and our learned habits, okay, are the ones that in a way somehow shape our teaching style in the future if you decide to be a teacher, okay? Now, we may say, so this is the way, I mean, what has happened will condition what we do, of course, it will. But the power is in you to be able to revise your teaching practice and see and reflect on it and see what changes could be introduced to make it better, why not? Or under the light of new, uh, uh, let's say, theoretical ideas in terms of pedagogy, in terms of language, right? Well, there, in, in terms of tools available, why not? Then under this light, uh, you, Reinspect your own teaching, revise it, and introduce changes. And we do not introduce changes to our teaching practice 
uh, every time something goes wrong. No, I mean, it's just a matter of revising and making it better. It's not necessarily something that went wrong that will make us reflect, right? Because uh, if you think about this, I mean, you can never remain the same, not even as a human being. Your body changes, your mind changes because you are in constant adaptation, all right? Accommodation, adaptation, all right? Remember Piaget's idea? Okay, so that's why, I mean, it makes sense to revise our teaching practice. All right, so when we say school biographies, we are referring to our, uh, let's say, paths as learners. And why not, we may even refer to, uh, let's say, the experiences you have undergone here in the teacher training program, okay? Generally, when we talk about them, we it's very difficult to say what they are and what they represent. Generally, we learn to read between the lines as we analyze what we do or the decisions we make on our feet, right? So let's start reading about this. It says, well, in chapter two, we presented the four key elements of our model. Uh, so that is, that is to say, con social constructivism. The perspective we have taken is based on a particular view of knowledge. This is this one, which sees knowledge as essentially constructed by individuals rather than transmitted from one person to another. Mm -hmm. But which recognizes also that such constructions always occur within specific contexts, mainly as a result of social interactions. Okay, so here we are. Right? Let's read this. We see this is not a linear sequence of events, but as a dynamic process whereby those with more knowledge, known as mediators, influence and are influenced by those with less knowledge, as occurs in parent child or teacher learner relationships. This is often achieved by say, setting various tasks and responding to the ways in which the learner attempts those tasks. In addition, the environment within which this occurs will itself influence and be influenced by teaching learning processes and its outcomes. Although we recognize the inherent contradiction in separating out each of these elements and treating them as somehow distinct from each other, we feel that such a separation, albeit artificial, albeit means even though, okay, is necessary in order to enable readers to make their own sense of what each part contributes to the dynamic role. In the present chapter, therefore, we shall focus on what individual teachers bring of themselves to the teaching learning processes. Okay, so then, I mean, it goes on about... Um, the teacher as a mediator in chapter four, okay? Studies in effective teaching. Well, this is, I mean, one of the main worries of most educational researchers uh, has to do with what? Uh, making teaching effective, right? And well, somehow collecting information on what could be the features, right? That somehow, shape, right, or tailor uh, an ideal teacher, okay? So is this possible? Well, in the first two chapters, we examine a number of different ways in which people have tried to explain how learning occurs. Similarly, there have been many different attempts to account for effective teaching. Once again, some of these fall within a positivist paradigm, that is, that are mainly concerned with measuring characteristics of teachers, with correlating information, and with drawing general conclusions from the results obtained. These are sometimes referred as process product studies in that one of their major concerns has been to identify what kind of action on the part of teachers is most likely to bring about a desired result. So it's like, 
when you want an effective teacher and you seek for effective classroom, uh, let's say, actions in order to guarantee what? A result, passing exams, okay? Good grades. We shall first examine some of these studies of what makes a good teacher before considering an alternative perspective. So in this book, The Essence of Good Teaching in 1984, Erickson, which is not uh, Erickson, okay, describes a study in which the views of the learners and administrators about teachers were analyzed. The conclusion reached was that an outstanding teacher should be an inspiring instructor who is concerned about students, an, an active scholar who is respected by disciplined peers, and an efficient organized professional who is accessible to students and colleagues. Let's analyze this. Can you tell me in different words the ideas behind this description? An outstanding teacher should be an inspiring instructor who is concerned about students, an active scholar who is respected by disciplined teachers or peers, and an efficient organized professional who is accessible to students and colleagues. What can you tell me about this? What is it expected? Inspiring instructor who is concerned about students. What can you say about that? Please open up the microphone and answer. I think it has to do probably with uh, the teacher caring about the students' learning processes. Uh, mm -hmm. The teacher cares that they learn mm -hmm. and he or she can inspire them to mm -hmm. keep on learning. That inspiration, what do you think it, it has to do with what? With trying to do what with the students? Because it's not the same mm -hmm. should be an instructor than saying should be an inspiring instructor. to engage them maybe in the mm -hmm. lessons. Mm -hmm. So if you try to engage them, you're going to use different techniques, right? That motivate the students. Because if we say engagement, we are somehow calling for motivation, okay? So there, there is some responsibility that is placed upon the teacher figure. Can you, can you see? Inspiring, concerned, Look at the next one, active scholar, efficient, organized, accessible. Can you see that it's full of adjectives? Mm -hmm. When we say that it is an active scholar, what do we mean? It would be a professional that is active at uh... Yes, a professional that is what? Updated, perhaps, okay? It's active at uh, secondary school or established where education is take it. I think that active scholar means that who is updated in terms of the 
the field he's studying or she is teaching, okay? All right, that is to say you are knowledgeable that you go on studying. That is an active scholar, right? Now, who is respected by disciplined peers, right? Efficient, organized professional. Okay, that is to say, organization, efficiency in terms of work, right? And that is open when we say accessible to students that students can talk to and colleagues go for reference, okay? So many, uh, let's say qualities, right? that uh, are called upon the teacher mm, to satisfy or to cater for. Now, this is just one of the many studies in which various personal characteristics of good teachers have been sought. See, Brumi, well, there we have, such studies generally produce lists of characteristics like those in the study cited by Ericsson or describe desirable ways of behaving as in merit, wait, uh, merit and well done, positive teaching mode. Then we have, well, review of um, Ant, Rose, and Shine, and first review a number of process product studies in which various forms of teachers' behavior were connected with measuring measurable learning outcomes such as test results. From these, they identified nine factors contributing to effective teaching. Clarity of presentation, teacher enthusiasm, variety of activities during the lessons, achieved oriented, achievement oriented behavior in classroom, opportunity to learn criterion material, acknowledgement and stimulation of students' ideas, criticism, that means no criticism, use of structuring comments at the beginning and during the lessons, and guiding of students' answers. Okay, perhaps some of them may ring a bell to you because we read let's say questions that prompted us to observe these behaviors in the teacher and to inspect them and take notes as we say observe, right? Now, the idea is that this is true, but this is not the formula to be an effective teacher. Why? Because I think that, uh, well, perhaps we can think of efficient teachers, but not effective, right? As they are not machines, all right? And sometimes you can perform better than others, depending on the group and the rapport you establish with them and reciprocation too. There are many things that condition the efficiency, right? And that has to do with motivation factors that do not just depend on the teacher's glamour, let's say, okay? So it is like, it seems, it seems that everything is on the teacher's shoulder and there are variables that condition teaching and learning, okay? So, is it possible for me to, let's say, uh, create opportunities to learn criterion material, that is to say material that is, uh, let's say, real world or that is uh, useful for students to learn if I have only two lessons per week? Can I expect them to develop uh, to the most communicative skills if they have very few chances to participate in class because we are short of time or because the, the classes or yes, I mean the classes, the groups are too large. 
So my questions are these. Would you say that a teacher is not a good teacher because of this? If much of what happens sometimes, it is somehow affected by factors that are out of her control or his control. You see what I mean? Right? So this cannot be a checklist to say you are a good teacher or you are not. Okay, but it could help you, let's say, reflect on what is missing, what should be strengthened, what could be boosted on you. What, uh, let's say, what aspects of your teaching are, let's say, outstanding and which are the ones that are weaker and you may decide to work on this. All right, but it cannot be a checklist. All right. Now it says, although some attempts have been made to translate these and similar findings into gu guidelines for action, on the whole, they have proved surprisingly unhelpful to most teachers seeking to improve their professional practice. This is partly because such factors are themselves open to a variety of interpretations. What exactly is meant by enthusiasm? But also because in the real world, good teachers come in all shapes and sizes, with a wide range of different personalities, beliefs, and ways of working. They also come from different backgrounds and belong to different cultures. And think about this. Do you believe that Japanese teachers, Japanese teachers who teach English, are the same as Argentinian teachers? Why? They are not. Because they are, in a way, belong to a culture in which there are, let's say, habits, customs, ways of doing things that are natural or maybe unnatural for the culture, okay? So it is probably the, this cultural identity of each teacher within the context where she or he is teaching that will determine, right, what is expected or not, okay? Get what I mean? Yes? All right. So they also come from different backgrounds and belong to different cultures. As we were saying, we would therefore expect them to work in different ways that suit their own personalities and situations. In Bennett's original study of effective teachers, for example, one of the most highly rated teachers demonstrated very few of the descriptors of how an effective teacher should behave. So, Mm, contrary to what everybody believed, this teacher was completely different from the checklist, all right? In another study of effective teaching, Brown and McIntyre report a study of the opinions of 72, uh, 75, 12 to 13-year-olds in one city comprehensive school, you know that a comprehensive school that would be something like um, Ciclo Basico, right? Bachillerato, okay, where, I mean, the orient there are orientations, but they are not like the polytechnicals. Um, uh, as, as regards to what made a good teacher, 10 categories were identified as representing elements of good teaching. And read this. Created a relaxed and enjoyable atmosphere in the classroom. Retaining control in the classroom presenting work in an interesting and motivating way, providing conditions so pupils understand the work, making clear what pupils are to do and achieve, judging what can be expected of a pupil, helping pupils with difficulties, encouraging pupils to raise their expectations of themselves, developing 
personal mature relationships with pupils and demonstrating personal talents or knowledge. So in all these ideas, there are concepts we have discuss discussed before. Okay? I want you to work in groups, right? For five minutes. And from this list, reel off these concepts that we have, uh, that are being addressed in all these ideas. Okay, do you understand? Yes, what you have to do. So what is, and that is, this is an exercise that I want you to do. And if anybody is watching this video before, um, uh, I mean, after the lesson, please uh, uh, stop the, the video, play pause, right? And try to work it out, as to say, and then check it with uh, um, our discussion. Because this is what you will have, this kind of exercise, this kind of rehearsal, you have to do it when you analyze what you observe. So you will never see the concepts. The concepts will not be popping up. Oh, this is the lead in. Oh, here the teacher wants to interact with the students. Oh, this is a technique to engage students who seem to be distracted. Okay, no. That will never be uh, let's say on that I, there will be no subtitles or anybody's going to tell you what it is. You will discover it. But how? By reading between the lines, by analyzing what is going on in the observations. Okay, so I'm going to pause now. Mm. Do you see this? Okay, if not, I'm going to play a trick. I'm going to send this on WhatsApp, okay? For you to have it, right? Let me organize the breakout rooms. <laughs> Give me a second. Where was that? Here. No, this is not. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, let's see what you have, uh, let's say, discussed. Listen, people, we have to discuss this, all right? So you will have to open up your microphones. We identified mm -hmm. that developing personal mature relationships with pupils is related to rapport. Okay, very good. That is establishing rapport. Very good. What else? Mm 
we said that it is connected to humanism to the extent that the student is seen as a whole person and their feelings and emotions are important in how they build knowledge and learning. Mm -hmm. And so they will learn to the extent that they feel at peace and in a relaxed and enjoyable atmosphere. Mm -hmm. They can learn if they are afraid of the teacher or the lesson itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so creating a relaxed and enjoyable atmosphere in the classroom has to do with a humanistic view on the fact that we should create, right, an atmosphere of safety and dependence, right? Remember that depend when we talk about dependence, we think about, I mean, some a, a feeling that means you trust, okay, generating trust. Retaining control in the classroom, that is somehow picturing what? Or featuring what? Classroom management. And that's it. And presenting work in an interesting and motivating way. Contextualizing. That is to say, you sort of recreate in the classroom real world situations. That may not be directly, uh, I mean, like um, situations that they will face in life, but at least will create. Uh, an atmosphere where they believe they are surrounded or the language is being used in a topic of interest of the students, okay? So that's why contextualizing, asking the students to incorporate digital, uh, let's say, um, skills, which they are in contact, right, on a daily basis. Hmm? It makes uh, our teaching practice and our teaching proposal more versatile, more ample, and more fruitful for the students. Okay, then providing conditions so pupils understand the work. We considered that as part of Vygotsky's proposal of scaffolding. Scaffolding, I don't know the pronunciation. Mm -hmm. That is scaffolding, right? Scaffolding. Uh, yes. Laddering, yes. that's another another mediation. Yes, where... the teacher the more knowledgeable other sets mm -hmm. the condition for the student to help them learn. That's it. Very good. Okay. Right, um, encouraging pupils to raise the expectations of themselves. What do you think it means? That is helping to what? I think it's. Uh, I think it has to do with a Maslow pyramid. Mm -hmm. Yes. When okay. it states the need for self stem steam. Sorry. Yes, that's it. Okay. Then I mean self esteem, appreciation, acknowledgement. And uh, in a way, uh, you mm, give a place to every student to have a voice, opportunities. So, I mean, you matter in the classroom or the student matters in the classroom, right? Uh, and what about... Um, 
developing personal mature relationships with students. No ideas about this? I mm -hmm. Sorry, I think yeah. it has to do with the pyramid of Maslow as well. The need to um, to develop a sense of belonging to a group. Mm -hmm. Right. And it also fostered in interaction. Not just, uh, remember that Trisha says that uh, sometimes the teacher feels all alone, right, by the front. But it has to do, I mean, interaction. There is a lot of interaction between the teacher and the students, but there should be teacher, students, students, and students. Okay. So communication channels are open in different ways. Remember interaction patterns? Mm hmm. And helping pupils with difficulties. What do you think about judging, I mean, helping people uh, or pupils or students with difficulties? Maybe it, it is connected to the concept of mediation when a teacher, a parent, or a peer, a peer. find ways of helping other people in this case. It is the right to be given opportunities. And it's not just the person who knows or the best students, right? The ones that, uh, let's say, somehow rule the classroom, right? That everybody, in a way, we are, we are saying that uh, everybody has a voice in the classroom and that guarantees fairness and equality, okay? Equality is really important, even though there may be differences, right? Because, I mean, you will never get homogeneous classes. That is a, a, a utopy, right? You never get the same level of students in, in, in a class, okay? And then, Mm, retaining control in the classroom, demonstrating personal talents, okay, while well, it has to do with personalization, right? And well, there I want to focus on some quotes that I really uh, find inspiring, right? A constructivist view of education. The generally acknowledged father of constructivism, Ernan. Ernst von Glasserfeld argues that education is an essentially political enterprise with two main purposes, to empower learners to think for themselves and to perpetuate in the next generations ways of acting and thinking that are judged the best by the present generation. So generally, I mean, uh, your present teachers influence the decisions that 
they make in the class, but they apply to today's. Now, now, in the future, I don't know whether they will be that good, right? He argues, moreover, that all knowledge is instrumental, that is, it is used for particular purposes and is meaningless in isolation, which goes uh, counter, right, in um, to what, or goes against what, what was done in behaviorist school, okay? Because of this, learners need to know the reasons why they are required to act in particular ways. And that is mentioned here, right? The fact that you uh, say what the students are expected to do. They're setting goals. What do you want them, what do you want to achieve with these students? So you say, and you they are not just setting rules, it's about thinking about objectives that make sense to the students. The first thing required, therefore, is that the students be given the reasons why particular ways of acting and thinking are considered desirable. This entails explanations of the specific context in which the knowledge to be acquired is believed to work. So that's why if you create situations in the classrooms that they are likely to prove some meaning outside, then it makes sense. Sometimes it's not clearly spotted by students, so it's necessary to refer to it and explain or show it to the students, okay? In von Glasserfer's view, a constructivist approach to education is better, is best put into practice by presenting issues, concepts, and tasks in the form of problems to be explored in dialogue rather than as information to be ingested and reproduced. This is best performed by what he terms the teacher orienting function. The teacher cannot tell students what concepts to construct or how to construct them. But by judicious use of language, they can be prevented from constructing in directions which the teacher considers futile, but which, as he knows from experience, are likely to be tried. This, of course, presents a dilemma in itself because by acting in such a preventative way, the teacher may restrict the very development of generally creative critical reflection that brings about new insights and even specific breakthrough. From Socrates onwards, the problem setting solving approach to teaching has had a number of powerful advocates, including John Dewey, Maria Montessori and Paulo Freire. Uh, there is a mistake there. Without ever coming to play the dominant role in pedagogy that it would seem to warrant. In recent years, however, there has been a resurgence of interest in this approach, exemplified by the Harvard Project Zero. Well, and here you have more studies, okay, on Feuerstein, Liebmann's. Liebmann, for example, is one author that is addressing Noonan's uh, book, okay. There has, we move forward, there has, however, been a considerable amount of interest in the use of problem-solving tasks in teaching a foreign language for a number of years, Noonan, Prabhu. This is the theme that we shall develop in chapter eight, where we discuss how task-based approaches to language teaching could involve tasks which foster thinking and problem solving. Well, that helps, I mean, work with cognitive skills. And this is what we mean to do, right? That is to say, create activities in which the students are challenged somehow. And that is why we talk about grading. It's not that mechanical activities are, let's say, useless. No, they are the first stepping stones. Okay? And, and once you feel more self-assured, you move on to more challenging ones. Okay? Um, well, um, well, there, uh, you can read, um, von Glasserfeld's, um, 
let's say ideas about problem solving, right? Activities. And I want you to read this. It says, for education to be an enriching experience, the meanings that emerge must become personal. And they must be significant and important in some parts of, of the person's life. Meanings must be also viable. And that is, they must prove useful and effective in mediating one's transactions. Transactions with stored knowledge, with people and with the world around. So can you see that here in this idea, stored knowledge, knowledge is given, to, is given importance. That is to say, is it that constructivism does away with memory, with, uh, let's say, learning, practicing, rehearsal, trial and error and all that? No, it means that it doesn't get stuck there. All right. The problem with the other schools of thought, they thought it was enough to do that. But you need to open that knowledge to and to somehow place it in situations where communication happens or where comprehension is needed, depending on, on the, the type of language course you are taking. So it makes sense for a medicine student to learn how to analyze an abstract and to know how to detect passive voice, for example, to understand data, okay? But it, that, that doesn't make sense, right, for somebody who's studying general English for communicative purposes, okay? So I need to work on the language more on a, uh, on a different way with different situations and different tasks and to teach passive voice, but for them to be able, okay, to, uh, let's say, give emphasis, perhaps to, not to the doer of the action, but people or things that receive some kind of, of, of uh, let's say, influence by others when you don't care who did the action. That's to say, I was given a bunch of flowers on my 50th, uh, let's say, birthday. That makes sense. And that's passive voice. You see? Okay. So, I mean, it has to do with this, right? You need to see who you are teaching, why you are teaching, what they need, and then decide upon not only the syllables, but the activities you're going to give them. Okay, right? Well, and looked at, looked at in this way, the essence of effective teaching and learning becomes understanding how meaning becomes attributed and conducting conversations that elaborate, relate and extend personal meaning. So personal meaning is paramount, right? In this section, we have discussed some of the key themes that emerge from taking a constructivist perspective on education. We see that from such viewpoint, education becomes concerned with helping people to make their own meanings. We see also that presenting learners with problem solving activities becomes an important part of putting such an approach into practice. This discussion sets the scene to consider next to next what constructivist has uh, constructivism has to offer when examining what makes a good teacher. So if you imagine, we say, oh, let's teach the students vocabulary related to airports, the different things you have to do as you take a flight. I mean, the fact that you have to be with some time in advance, you, they have, the fact that you have to show that in the suitcase, you shouldn't include uh, some objects, if you are going to keep it with you on the plane or if you are going to dispatch it. Uh, imagine you teach all that, all right? Within timetables, perhaps, or why not uh, procedures and you focus on the simple present, all right? Even though it may have some kind of future meaning, 
right? And you may say, mm -hmm. and some people say, ¿para qué le vas a enseñar esto a tus alumnos si ellos no se van a tomar un avión? I have heard comments like that in teachers. Okay, and that is very sad to hear. Okay, believe it or not. But in fact, you are teaching them about the world. You are teaching them about what? About situations that they may encounter in the future that they should be acquainted with. They cannot go to the airport last minute as if they were to catch a, a bus, right? Just to give you one extreme example, right? Now, they should. you are teaching them more than language. You are teaching them how to, uh, uh, what to do when they, are, when they are at the airport, what is expected from them. And I don't know, maybe today, okay, they, mm, they are, um, their parents, uh, let's say, uh, are not doing well uh, economically and all that. But you never know if that uh, student will not become a successful, right, uh, person in terms of, let's say, being able to study or to pursue a, co a course, I mean, or any type of work or to start their own business. <coughs> or something like that, that then they will be faced with these situations. And in a way, it's showing them the world. This is the world. You can do this, all right? You can travel. You can uh, talk to other people. So if if we, uh, let's say, in a way, um, despise our students, or we believe they will never reach any goals, why should we teach them English then? I mean, that is really very, very, uh, let's say, wicked and mean to think that some students will never have uh, the opportunity to do, uh, to travel, to speak to others in English. I mean, no matter. Right, we have to show them the best of the world, right, and get them prepared. And maybe by showing them bites of the world, we might somehow awaken in them the desire to achieve better goals and not to remain right uh, passive in their lives. You see, so that has to do with constructing. Uh, let's say a world it's not creating a world of of lies and all that but showing that well this is you may one day all right i mean try to say and hope for them for a good future not to think that they perpetuate let's say um the conditions they are in now if we are thinking about uh underprivileged students okay so it's like see, uh, sowing seeds, right? That might mm, start growing and blossom in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, um, a constructivist view of teaching. Constructivism holds basically there is never anyone right to teach. In considering what a constructivist approach offers to teachers, von Glanzenfer asserts, constructivism cannot tell teachers new things to do, but it may suggest why certain attitudes and procedures are counterproductive, and it may point out opportunities for teachers to use their own spontaneous imagination. Teaching like learning must be concerned with teachers making sense of meaning from the situations in which they find themselves. Researchers have used a variety of different methods in their attempts to understand the meaning that teachers make of their own work, ranging from investigating the thinking and planning that teachers do outside the class. No, no. Through ethnographic studies of their routines, rules, and patterns of teaching, that is, a, a, an ethnographic study is when you 
write every single every single thing that happens in the classroom and you may have and you may keep an ethnographic study or record when you observe but i have not requested that because it's it's really time consuming and it could be well there we cannot see the next page oh wow well. this is what happened the, uh, with the other five uh, it didn't load I don't know. I think it might be the. Mm -hmm. I think I have to refresh the page. Maybe if I do that. Wait a second. Let's see if it works, right? Mm Let's see now, again, let's see if it works. Mm -hmm. We were here. Well, it was page like, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Give me patience. Well, we're far. This is chapter two. Mm -mm. We were here. Yes. Near, near, near. Come on. Load, load, load. Yes, now it's working, isn't it? Yes. We were here. Now, the idea, right, is, okay, to understand, right, some concepts that have to do with teaching, okay? And what we believe the traditions and what we talked about teachers' horizons. Are you there? Yes? I cannot, I'm sharing the, the screen, so I cannot see you. That's why. Are you there? Yes? Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, Follow then the fatal, the fatal flaw that pervades most attempts to improve teaching is a failure to understand this point. If teacher improvement projects, projects sorry, are ever to be successful, they should always begin with the question, how does this change relate to this teacher's understanding of their work? What this in turn will lead us to do is to pay close attention to the meaning that teachers make of physical environment of their classrooms, the syllabus, or the particular teaching practices, and to act in accordance with our understanding of these meanings. So, Lou then also introduces us to the notion of teachers' horizons of understanding, which are constantly in the process of formation but which are constructed within traditions. So, teacher's horizons, okay? So it has to do with what you have built, right, as a learner, right, and as a student at university, and larger frames of reference which provide shared ways of making sense. That is to say, you have traditions, but then you are confronted with new problems and somehow you are pushed by situations to face challenges. And in order to face and tackle with these uh, challenges or problems, right? You have to start changing those traditions, thinking or looking for new ways, learning new ways. So this, okay, gives you like an insight or a better understanding of the problem. And this process will lead you to understand 
you're teaching much better. All that is the concept of teacher's horizons, which is closely related to the teacher as a refle reflective practitioner. Okay, so I used to say you, and this is, and you may say, and why is it that we are reading this? I, I really don't see the point. Why? Because you are, in two months, you will have to make decisions. And when things don't go well, you have to change them. You have to replan. Sometimes, before giving the lessons, sometimes this happens in situ. So you need to think about this. And these teachers' horizons, right? And remember when you first attempted giving, uh, let's say, a short presentation or, uh, let's say, teaching or asking the students, giving instructions and showing the students examples. Remember that I uh, gave you feedback and I said, check on this, you better think about, well, all this is, it is part of your teacher's horizons together with what we have been working on. But there are, let's say, personal decisions that you will make that somehow will tailor or let's say describe your teaching persona. So there will be a personal touch. That's why in the task that I uploaded this, uh, this morning, right? It's you doing this or attempting because you will be using textbooks in the future, but you will have to adapt them. So I need you to, to work on that. That's why I'm asking you to do that. It's not just a matter of, oh, this is mechanical, this is meaningful, this is uh, uh, communicative or productive. No, it's not just that. It's, well, this is, this productive activity is too soon. My students need more, let's say, more practice or more guidance. Or the other way around, the other way around, sorry. Uh, I mean, the students have been doing a lot of mechanical activities and you say, well, I ha we had enough. Let's do something more demanding. And you change it. Because that is the feeling you get as you interact with the students and see how they are performing. You see? So this is something, these are teachers, let's say, decisions. Even though there is a textbook, even though there is a workbook, the, there's a lot of material and all that, you are the one that makes, you you are the one that plays the instrument. Okay? And the students will dance to the music. Okay? Hmm? All right. Uh, so this is important. The fact that when confronted by new problems and challenges, a teacher struggles to resolve them in ways that are consistent with the understanding she brings to the problem. And this process leads in, leads in turn to new horizons of understanding about teaching. I mean, once you were able to tackle a problem, you found a, a possible solution uh, or a way of dealing with discipline problems, say, right? And then, well, you say, well, this is, something that worked, I will try it out with another group. If it works, I will incorporate it as part of my, let's say, teaching portfolio and display of techniques. And then perhaps then you will find a, even a much better way of improving or doing the same or something similar. So it's always building. It has to do with this. You are constructing yourself as a teacher. Then, as a language uh, does, a language teacher's horizons will be shaped in part by her own personal experiences, but also by traditional ways in which other language teachers throughout history have made sense of what it means to be a language teacher. I mean, as reaction or not to what other teachers have done with you, you may say, I remember that my teacher 
used to give us, and I didn't see much sense in this, right? So, well, perhaps you decide to do something different, okay? To make your lessons more, uh, let's say, um, unpredictable somehow, when you uh, stint to, let's say, to the same routine over and over again, and you um, remain highly predictable, the students, okay, may get bored, or that happened to you with one of the teachers, so you say, no, I want to do something different, and you start, let, let's say, changing those ways. So it's not that we are going to replicate. Sometimes we act uh, in a counter way. You see? Um, well, for you to read, I, I would like you to uh, to read up to, mm, let's see. Mm. We're going to talk about teachers' beliefs, okay? Right? Um, very briefly, just to round up. But this is something I do not want to miss, right? I know we are short of time, but beliefs about learners, you go on reading, okay? But this is where I'm going to, to make a stop. And what is, this is the way we sometimes regard the, the students. Teachers may hold any of a, or a combination of beliefs about those whom they teach. The sociologist Roland Megan has suggested that there are at least seven different ways in which teachers can do, uh, can and do construe learners, and that and that such constructions reflect individual teachers' views of the world and also have a profound influence on their classroom practice. Mayam suggests that learners may be construed metaphorically as resistors, receptacles, raw materials, clients, partners, individual explorers, and democratic explorers. Now, I am going to anticipate the fact that resistors, receptacles, and raw material somehow reflect a way of regarding the students from those, let's say, beliefs that are related to uh, reproductive approaches. What is that? Behaviorism and cognitivism, all right? Whereas clients, partners, individual explorers and democratic explorers are more in tune with humanistic, and social constructivist views, where the students have a voice. Can you see clients, partners, individual explorers? I mean, there is this idea of somebody speaking, somebody doing, whereas resistors, receptacles, raw material, no. All right? He sees these constructs in terms of a continuum, which reflects the nature of the teacher-learner power relationship. Thus, the first three constructs are heavily teacher-dominated, while the latter constructs involve increasingly active learner participation. The notion of the learners as resistors sees learners as people who do not want to learn, but only to do so because they are made to. Such a view has given rise to the commonly associated assumption that force or punishment is the most appropriate way of overcoming such resistance in the classroom. If you don't, uh, if you don't um, make silence when I explain, if you don't do the activities now, we will have a test next week. That is force or punishment. So the more you speak, the more homework I will give you. That is, I mean, the, the students, come to learn or come to understand that homework is punishment instead of studying, okay? Even at its most bending, the assumption that children do not start with what Brunner calls the will to learn will lead to view 
that instruction is the natural function of the teacher. An alternative view, of course, is that children being, begin school full of desire to learn, but gradually, sometimes even rapidly, lose their such desire as a result of their learning experiences. The psychologist and educator William Glasser explained this point particularly well in his book, Schools Without Failure. Very few children come to school failures. None come labeled as failures. It is a school and a school alone which pins the label of failure on children. It would be, of course, be, it would, of course, be naive to think that all the learners attending classes to learn a new language are there because they want to be. For a host of possible reasons, language learners might meet some degree of resistance from some of their learners. However, if learners are viewed narrowly and resistors, as resistors, teachers may well employ methods involving compulsion rather than seeking ways of helping them. So this is, I mean, this is what happens. It's like a chain reaction. If a teacher believes the students are resistors, she's going to do things in the classroom that have to do with imposing. Okay? And it doesn't work. Neither for children, nor for adolescents or adults. Okay? Now, receptacles. What is that? Well, it's like believing that the students are empty vessels and they should be filled in with what? With knowledge. And you are the one that possesses the knowledge. Okay? So it also refers to, I mean, like the Jackson Max um, or Jackson Max theory. And what is that? The teacher is seen as having the large jug of knowledge which is poured into the learner's mugs or receptacles, which uh, in turn, can only accept a certain amount of that knowledge according to the size of the learner's IQ. So you have a small cup of coffee, you are more intelligent, so you are a mug, all right, you, okay, right, believe it or not. Uh, here again, we can see that instruction and information giving become the natural way of working with uh, for teachers. And they are assumptions, all right? And then Freire speaks about what? This banking conception of question, of, of education. That is to say, I teach you everything I consider you should know, but then at the end of the year or at the end of the semester, right? I will withdraw all the knowledge and prove that my teaching was, uh, was uh, let's say, effective. So banking account, I make deposits of knowledge and then at the end of, it, of, of the month or the term, I give you a test to prove that that money is there. Okay? The money that would be the knowledge, right? So that is based, based on what? On transmission, the same as uh, I mean, it falls into the category of what? Of receptacles. And the other is raw material. What is that? Well, you believe you are the role model. And in a way, everything you wish the students to do has to do with your own uh, perception of the world. And the students will replicate your convictions in a way. So everybody that dances to your music, right? Uh, and, and the students don't have a voice. In fact, I design, I make decisions, and I tell you what to do. So you become little Sandras. Okay? Younger ones. All right? That is molding the students to your own, uh, let's say, uh, mm, yes, pre not predictions, I would say taste or likes or mm, choices, okay? And then you have the teacher uh, who, the notion of the learner as a client, uh, what is that? I mean, ah, oh, well, they are, they pay me a fee and I have to please them. No, I mean, 
As a client in the sense that the student has objectives of his or her own, he talks to you about what he or she needs and you somehow tailor a, a kind of course or you prepare lessons based on what the students really need. And that is, the let's say, reflected in English for specific purposes. Remember that it's not just business English. Okay? Then, the learner as a partner, is it has to do with this idea of mediation in which the teachers uh, the teachers and the learners interact most of the time. This is really constructivist. And in a way, the teacher is learning new things by that have to do with teaching or, or language by asking questions sometimes. For example, I want to learn how to use PowerPoint with animation. All right, so let's work on this. Let's make a, a PowerPoint presentation. You help me and you teach me how to use the different tools. You see? Okay, I know that somebody has written on the chat. Uh -huh. Okay, yes, yes, yes. I understand. Who is your literature teacher, Ricardo? Okay, well. Just to round up, uh, those who need to go, okay, you can leave the room. I want to finish with this, this section, okay? Uh, so it has to do with this. You help me learn something. I learn together with you, but at the same time, you are learning how to use the language in this, let's say, a, a layout or format. So it's like really very democratic in a way. And the democratic and the individual explorer, perhaps the democratic one has to do with more cooperative learning, right? And collaborative uh, approach on tasks and, and project work. But individual and, uh, and democratic explorers are the ones that somehow similarly to uh, the, the, the learner as a client, they work for the sake of what? of, uh, let's say, dealing with uh, real life situations and out of curiosity and motivation. But they are re the teacher becomes just a facilitator who somehow explores the input and organizes the input. And this, that is more like a flipped classroom fashion. All right? I mean, this happens especially when the students are more mature. The individual and democratic explorers are students who are really in command of themselves. They really know what they want, okay? Perhaps you can think of learners as partners, right? And why not clients, but it may be the parents also participating uh, uh, in designing the objectives. Uh, in this aspect, I would say that that can happen, right, with any learner of any at any age. Whereas democratic explorers and individual explorers need some degree of responsibility and self-control, which some which children or pre-adolescents or adolescents uh, may not have, right? Because they are distracted with other things and that's natural and that's okay. All right. Well, this was really important because you will probably see these beliefs, not just the teachers about the learners, but the learners showing themselves this way. And I think that you need to see this right? You will notice it. Now that we have read and discussed this, I'm sure you will spot it when you go to, to the schools, okay? Oh, probably you have already, okay? Well, so work on this. As soon as you have it ready, I will write my email um, account here so that you send me when you start working on the tasks so I can give you feedback as soon as possible. Remember that I told you that I was traveling. That's why I want to keep myself 
at home so as to be okay for uh, Thursday I'm traveling um, and do, from Thursday until uh, Wednesday I won't be here in Paraná so I won't be able to correct it so the sooner you work on this the better okay well then uh, see you right um, wait a second Yes. I uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. For Let tomorrow me... we have to do the sorry. I'm going to stop the recording.